will now welcome our second panel. Mr. Stephen Shaw is the Deputy General Counsel for Contractor Responsibility at the Department of the Air Force, where he also serves the Air Force Suspension and Debarment Official. Mr. Richard Pelletier is the Suspension and Debarment Official for the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, Dr. Nick Nyack is the Chief Procurement Officer at the Department of Homeland Security. Ms. Nancy Gunderson is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Grants and Acquisition Policy and Accountability for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, where she also serves as the Department Suspension and Department Official. Uh, as I had mentioned before, we are watching for votes. We are tracking through those. We should have enough time to be able to get everyone's opening statement in, into that. So pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. Would you please rise and raise your right hands? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record reflect all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. Thank you. In order to allow time for discussion, I am going to ask that you do limit uh, your testimony to five minutes. Your entire written statement, of course, will be made a part of the written record and any other written documents that you would like to submit to this uh, committee we will include. I now would like to recognize Mr. Shaw for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Connolly, members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me here today. This is a very important subject that is uh, dear to my heart. I have been doing this for 15 years and, and find it to be extremely important. Uh, I also want to thank GAO for an outstanding report in this area, even though they didn't address the Air Force, they addressed some important issues. Uh, their recommendations are recommendations that we agree with. Uh, we have the three elements of active programs that they talk about. We have a dedicated staff. We have uh, written processes and procedures, uh, and we have uh, uh, you know, uh, practices that encourage referrals. I'm hesitating on the referrals a little bit because one of the features of the Air Force uh, is not to rely upon referrals. Referrals are important. Procedures to increase referrals are important. But we do a lot more than deal with our inbox and, and respond to referrals from other agencies, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, the areas that are somewhat unique, perhaps, to the Air Force, or, or at least uh, are why we are strong in this area, we think, are both structural and policy-related. And the structural areas are the full-time dedicated staff. We have, through the entire 15 years of my tenure in this position and before that, had a full-time staff. And more recently, we have expanded that to uh, full-time field staff in the AFMC, the Air Force Material Command, and in headquarters for the non-MAGCOMs. Uh, so we have additional attorneys. So there are uh, somewhat uh, up, upwards of 10 or 15 attorneys that we have in the Air Force, only, even though there are only three in, in my office uh, in headquarters Air Force. Another unique part is that I am a full-time debarring official, and that is very unusual in the Federal Government. Uh, I personally think that is extremely important, and I praise the Air Force for doing that. It was before my time. It has nothing to do with me, uh, but I think that is an important feature. There are only three or four agencies in the whole Federal Government that have the full-time debarring official, and, and I think that is an important feature for some of the reasons that I will talk about. Also, separation from the acquisition chain, I think, is critical in this area. The Air Force uh, and the whole DOD started doing this in the early 90s as a result of a uh, in, uh, IG report, DOD IG report, recommending that it be structured that way. And, and I agree with them, and I think that the Defense Department is doing that correctly in that way. We are independent of the acquisition chain. We certainly coordinate with them, and they are partners with us. But I don't uh, wait or expect the acquisition people to approve of what I'm doing. I'm empowered to do uh, what is right. And that's the third important feature of the Air Force, and that is the empowerment. The senior leaders of the Air Force and of DOD have supported what I have done throughout my tenure, uh, recognize this as an independent area. I coordinate everything, but uh, I am empowered to do what is right. And the examples that I used in the written testimony attest to that. And then another feature is uh, perhaps it is uh, unusual and, or unique to the Defense Department, and that is the fraud remedies program I also manage within the Air Force. So I am overseeing two missions. One is coordinating and making sure the Air Force gets all of the remedies, criminal, civil, contract, and administrative, uh, done. And we are the, outs the, outs the inside lawyers, really, for the Justice Department in making those kinds of decisions. So because of that, we have real visibility into cases, and we can reach out and do suspensions and debarments even when nobody refers them to us. Uh, 
And that is where the, the outreach and the proactiveness that I was talking about comes in, where we don't wait for referrals. We monitor cases from the investigators, their case status reports. If there's some case that looks like it, it's necessary to do a suspension or debarment to protect the interest, the interest of the government, we will reach out to that uh, investigator, ask for the report, and we'll do a debarment, even though nobody is asking us to do that debarment. And even if people are objecting to it, we're going to do it if that's the right thing to do. On the policy uh, side of this, uh, the fact-based cases is an important part of what we do. I think there's a lot of agencies that only do debarments or suspensions where there's an indictment or a conviction. And I think that's ill-advised. That's, that's just delegating all of your power to the Justice Department. If they don't have the resources to do a case, they won't do it. But we in the Air Force are still worried about that. So we will reach out and do a debarment anyway based upon facts. Also, uh, it's not important or not necessary to do contract actions. I mean, it is not uh, the power of a debarment under the FAR is not limited to fraud in a government contract. If an Air Force contractor, for example, is committing fraud on a commercial case or personal income tax evasion or anything more than jaywalking, probably, we are going to be concerned about it because if they're defrauding a commercial customer, they're going to defraud us. Uh, and finally, the carrot and the stick we use, I talk about this a lot, because of the stick of debarment, we're able to influence proactively the defense industry, I think. And we go out and talk to the defense industry, and we give them incentives to improve their programs and processes to avoid the fraud at the front end. Uh, so we're, we're trying to limit fraud and, and uh, do risk management rather than solely doing the stick of debarment. And with that, I thank you, and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Peltier. Thank you, Chairman Langford and Ranking Member Connolly and members of the subcommittee uh, for this opportunity to speak about the EPA suspension and debarment uh, program. I'm a suspension and debarment official of the SDO for the agency. Since 1981, EPA has had a robust program. Uh, historically, it's been the leader in this area. For example, my predecessor uh, was the chairman of the ISDC, which you've heard some testimony about for 20 years. Uh, also, in, nine, in 2003, uh, with members of the Air Force, uh, DLA, and GSA, we formulated uh, the EPA actually led the formation of the National Suspension and Debarment Training Program, which is offered through the FLETSI, through the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center down in Glencoe, Georgia. Uh, currently, I am still the coordinator for that program, uh, and also EPA provides three of the six instructors for the three or four courses that we offer each year. Now, the EPA program has really two elements to it. It has a statutory debarment, and it also has a discretionary. Uh, the statutory are the Clean Air and the Clean Water Act, and the discretionaries are, can be taken under either the non-procurement rule, which you've heard some testimony about, as well as the FAR Part 9.4. Uh, at EPA, we are almost exclusively use the non-procurement common rule. At our office, uh, we have two in the EPA, we have two separate offices that deal with suspension and debarment program. There's my office. Uh, as a suspension and debarment official, I have a hearing officer and a program analyst. We also have a suspension and debarment division, which has a director. It has seven attorneys. Uh, it's a paralegal, two investigators, an auditor, and some support, uh, administrative support personnel. All of us are full-time, and this is all we do is suspension and debarment. Uh, the way the cases work at EPA, the uh, uh, suspension department, the division attorneys develop the case in close coordination with uh, the uh, OIG, for example, or the Office of Enforcement that we have, or any other state or federal investigative body or any public or private source that may provide us with information. Like Mr. Shaw said, we do fact-based cases as well. We coordinate, or the, uh, the division attorneys coordinate through the ISDC for lead agency, and then uh, it's referred to my office for an action. And then when proper notice, we provide the uh, respondents the opportunity to be heard, to present uh, information and arguments in opposition to the proposed debarment. When I make a final decision, uh, it is on behalf of not only the EPA but all federal agencies. Now, under the uh, EPA non-procurement rule, uh, as we have implemented it at EPA, there is an additional uh, safeguard in that uh, the respondent can appeal my decision to the director of the Office of Grants and Debarment 
prior to taking any court action under the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, just as a frame of reference, and the numbers are not magical, but just as a frame of reference, in the last fiscal year, our initial numbers indicated we took uh, 98 proposed debarments, 111 suspensions, 115 discretionary debarments, and approximately 42 statutory debarments. Uh, also, we entered into three administrative agreements. Now, the rate of EPA dollars spent procurement to non-procurement is approximately 4 to 1, and that is why we use the non-procurement rule uh, rather than the FAR. Uh, the both rules are reciprocal. So uh, you can, of course, any action under one is binding on the other. Also, you can use a non-procurement rule for acquisition as well as non-acquisition matters. So it is uh, available if you want to do it for a contract direct acquisition process. The written guidance that EPA has, we have uh, implemented, for example, uh, the uh, non-procurement rule is implemented by the agencies. We did that through our 2 CFR 1532. Uh, but also over the years, we have supplemented with written guidance, uh, SOPs, pre best practices that have been learned since 1981, and put those into a written form so it can be continued and consistently updated as we go through the process. Another factor that is important is the my superiors actively encourage our involvement not only with the ISDC, but also with uh, other agents, other uh, organizations that are involved in this, such as the ABA Subcommittee on Suspension and Debarment. Uh, we are very proud of our rich history of, of protecting the taxpayers' dollars. Uh, we uh, continue with this effort, and even in these hard times, we have been uh, able to continue to have the personnel necessary. And I am pleased to be able to talk about it today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. As you have just heard, the votes have been called on. I would like to receive both of your opening statements, and then we will scoot out for a recess from there. So, Mr. Nye. Thank you very much, Chairman and Ranking Member. Uh, I will abbreviate my statement uh, in, and hope that it helps you guys. Uh, I am the Chief Procurement Officer for DHS, overall contracting at DHS. Um, sort of in a nutshell, we get this, and we are going to get it right. We are going to be a best practice agency. Prior to my arrival, and I have been here for a little bit less than a year, there was an IG review of DHS suspension and debarment. Uh, we took that to heart. The Under Secretary for Management, who is my boss, uh, put together a task force. We studied all of the best practice uh, organizations. The Immigration Customs Enforcement is one of those best practices within DHS that we studied. Uh, we came out with a model, and since I have been on board, so a little bit less than a year, the Secretary approved a new program for suspension and debarment. It follows all of the best practices the GAO outlined. Um, we are committed to getting this right. We are going to have dedicated staff. We are going to have detailed policies and procedures. We are going to have an active referral process. And we are going to have a system for tracking referrals, suspensions, and, deb and debarments. And this is going to happen in, in short order. So we look forward to following up with the committee uh, over time. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nyack. And you are right. You are definitely abbreviated. I appreciate from that from there. Ms. Gunderson. Thank you. Chairman Langford, Ranking Member Connolly, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to appear before you to discuss the Department of Health and Human Services grants and acquisition policies and practices, and in particular our use of suspension and debarment in our oversight practices. As the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Grants and Acquisition Policy and Accountability, I serve as the Department's suspension and debarment official and am responsible for providing de department-wide leadership in the areas of grants and acquisition management. My office oversees and supports the Department's 13 grants management offices and 10 procurement activities as they award and administer grants and contracts in fulfilling HHS's mission to enhance the health and well-being of Americans. Fighting fraud and ensuring program integrity are central to fulfilling the Department's mission, and we appreciate the work of this subcommittee and the GAO in highlighting the policies and practices from which HHS may learn. The Department is committed to the effective use of suspension and debarment as a tool to support successful grant and acquisition management. HHS also believes that comprehensive pre-award source selection and post-award administration practices help ensure satisfactory performance and reduce our need to resort to suspension department as we focus our resources on these practices. As reported by the GAO, HHS debarred 29 grant recipients between 2006 and 2010. In fiscal year 2011, we also debarred six grant recipients 
and these debarment cases were based on financial misconduct as investigated by our Office of the Inspector General and scientific misconduct as investigated by our Office of Research Integrity in cooperation with the affected universities and research institutions. Through our contract administration processes from fiscal year 2009 through 2011, HHS terminated approximately 12 contracts for default. In these cases, the associated performance issues were not so serious in nature to impose either suspension or debarment. In light of the GAO's recommendations and an effort to strengthen our suspension and debarment processes, we are in discussions on how best to dedicate staff and resources to this function and related oversight activities, in particular to create a contractor integrity team. We are currently assessing the policies and practices of other agencies for contract-related suspension and debarment in order to tailor best practices to our organization and issue detailed policies and procedures. We also intend to create an electronic desk reference to implement the new policy and provide our contracting officers with associated reference materials and uniform decision-making tools regarding referrals for suspension and debarment, financial responsibility determinations, and other performance remedies. Additionally, we also plan to establish an electronic case referral and tracking process for both grant and contract-related concerns, which will enable HHS to monitor and follow through on each case and identify consistent themes and vulnerabilities. Finally, these policies and practices will be re reinforced through communication and training to ensure HHS's grants and acquisition communities understand their responsibilities and are able to identify and refer cases of fraud, misconduct, and the abuse of the public's trust in the Department's grants and acquisition programs. HHS strongly agrees with the need to protect taxpayer dollars and is committing to use it, committed to using its grants and acquisition management practices to serve as careful stewards of these funds. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee and about HHS's use of suspension and debarment in dealing with its grantees and contractors. I am glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Ms. Gunderson. With that, I would like to take a short recess. Let me give you an update on what we have. We have several votes and then a motion to recommit, unless you want to talk everybody out of doing a motion to recommit down there. No, okay. So it will take about um, probably 40 minutes or so. Uh, I would say on our votes and our time to be able to come back, we will get re restarted here as soon as we can with our questions and we will reengage. Again, I apologize for the delay, but we will stay in recess until we have finished up voting. Thank you. <laughs>